Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that's pretty good for the first try. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's a joy to be back at Digging Deeper again. Really enjoy the time together. And uh, before I get into our, our study and introducing it, uh, I did bring a couple books. Uh, these have been published this last year. There's uh, a book entitled Bible Numbers and Symbols. And so I take numbers, how they're used metaphorically in Scripture 1 through 40, um, and also how symbols are used throughout Scripture. That's one of the beautiful things about God's Word, 66 books, 40 are authors, but it's all the expression of one mastermind. And so God holds the meaning of colors and symbols and so forth all the way through Scripture. And numbers. Uh, plus, I didn't know this. Uh, when I came up with the idea for the cover design, one in ten men struggle with color blindness. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? you see anything in there? No? Okay. <laughs> he really is colorblind. So if uh, you want to take a little test, here it is. And if you have trouble figuring out what any of the symbols are, there's one uh, on the back too, you can ask me. And then the other book is The Parables That Christ Told. Uh, all 39 parables that Christ told are explained from a devotional format. So those books are over here. And thank you for praying for our family. Several of you have asked about uh, Trey. Thank you. And I really appreciate your prayers. All right, so last night... Um, Brother Mike was introducing the, the sanctifying power of the gospel, and then Brother Mercer was telling us uh, how the kingdom was taken away, and how God is laboring through scripture to um, bring a kingdom that will never pass away, and the Lord Jesus will have his rightful place, and there's a lot of milestones through scripture for, Lord, uh, for God to accomplish that, that the kingdom's coming, and it'll be an everlasting kingdom. So um, I'm picking up a topic I probably haven't taught on in at least a decade, but I was really drawn to it. It seems like if we're uh, really believing the, the sanctifying power of the gospel and that God is establishing a kingdom, a kingdom of priests, a uh, royal priesthood that will worship to him, we read that all the way back in Exodus. That was always God's desire. Even at Mount Sinai, he wanted a kingdom of priests. Uh, not just the Levites, but a kingdom of priests. And today we get to be part of that royal uh, and holy priesthood. That we should appreciate the message that brings that about. So what I'm going to be uh, thinking with you about the next um, five sessions, and then we'll do something of a devotional uh, point in the last session, is um, appreciating the advantage points of the different evangelists, the different gospel writers in their presentation of Christ. If you kind of picture a, a gem and a light shining on that gem, as you move around it from different vantage points, it's going to look different. It's going to have a different brilliant, brilliant, brilliance and hues and colors. And so what God the Father has done is through these four evangelists, for gospel writers, he is presenting his son to us from unique vantage points. And uh, last year I took up a topical study. Um, this year I was led to more of a devotional study. Next year, if we do this again, I'll probably do something of an expositional nature. But I really enjoy going back through and appreciating the way the Holy Spirit has intricately woven all these details from these four vantage points. And so, what does a father want us to appreciate about his son? Well, God's good news to mankind is from four unique perspectives. And, Steve, this may be in your way. I'm going to move it back a little bit. And this is um, the good news message of God. Uh, the God's son came from heaven to earth. He is both the message and the messenger. And from the four different gospel writers, uh, there's different perspectives that God wants us to appreciate. Um, we see that there are three uh, Jewish writers and one Greek writer. 
As far as we know, Luke is the only Gentile writer in the entire Bible. When you start looking at Matthew, Mark, and John, it's very obvious that there's a lot of differences between the different uh, presentations of Christ. There are exclusions and inclusions in the accounts. For example, why is it that Matthew and Luke record the birth of Christ, but Mark and John don't? What, why do we have the genealogies of Christ presented in Matthew and Luke, but no genealogies in Mark and John? Why does Mark and Luke record the ascension of Christ, but Matthew's gospel and John's gospel do not? There's very um, particular reasons why that is. Uh, when we look at John's gospel, you'll find words like believe, the world, over and over again, but you won't find the word repent or forgive in John's gospel. Man, when you look at Matthew and Luke, repent and forgives everywhere. You get to John's gospel, and you won't find it there. And it's John's uh, presentation of Christ, and that answers that, that reason. Um, we see in Luke's gospel, particularly, ten times he's a, he's a praying um, son of God. He uh, meets often with his father early in the morning. Uh, it's interesting when you get into John, a, a different word for prayer is used than the synoptic gospels. And it's to give a, a that uphold his presentation of the Lord Jesus from uh, being divine in essence. So there's a lot of variations uh, you look at Matthew and you look at Luke, lots of parables. In uh, Mark's gospel account, nine parables, less than one-fourth. You get to John, no parables. Why is that? And again, uh, layers and layers, really, of revelation that God is bringing together for us as he upholds his son from these four unique vantage points that we would be really enthralled with his son. Uh, key words like in Matthew's gospel, kingdom. Mountains, very prevalent in Matthew's gospel, not as prevalent in others. And so these are the kinds of, if the Spirit of God has been very clear and consistent, then we should appreciate um, those uh, individual aspects of the gospel presentations. Now what is clear is that the, the gospels don't present a complete biography of the Lord Jesus, right? We have some... Uh, Luke particularly gives us the whole political situation at the time of Christ's birth. Uh, we have some details in Matthew and Luke concerning his birth, early childhood. He lived in Nazareth. But we really don't get a snapshot of his life again until he's 12 years old. And then he's around 30, Luke tells us, when his ministry began. So big gaps, uh, not a full biography of the life of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but yet... Everything that the Father wants us to know. With that, I'd like to look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And I'll be reading from the New King James version of the Bible. Some of the quotations are from the King James, but mostly from the New King James. God, who at various times and in various ways spoken in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the power or with the word of his power, when he made by himself when he had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of majesty on high. Verse 2, in these last days spoken to us by son. His is implied, but it's actually he's spoken to us by son. And so God, as he sent his son from heaven to the earth, he is both the message and the messenger. He is the living word. He's expressed image of God himself. What what God wants man to understand is presented in his son. 
And so for the next uh, four or five sessions, we'll be looking <clears throat> at this subject matter of what is it that the Father wants us to appreciate about the Son from the four different unique vantage points. All right, so why four Gospels? Why not um, seven Gospels? Isn't seven the perfect number? Six is the number of man. Christ became a man. Shouldn't maybe six Gospel accounts be perfect? Um, I talk about this in the, the book on numerology, that there are four perfect numbers, three, seven, ten, and twelve, that uphold different aspects of perfection, God's essence, or God's administration, or or God's rule. Um, the number three is a, a, a number that represents uh, divine fullness and perfection. Sometimes it's also associated with the resurrection, the number of resurrection. So look for that. For example, um, you can see it clear back in the Old Testament, both when Elijah and Elisha do their resurrections, the number three is present in both those resurrections. Um, you have, uh, for example, one of the prophets laying down on the, on the sun to raise him from the dead uh, three times. Another one, his, his uh, hands touch, mouth and eyes touch. So the number three is represented even in those resurrections. So God's very consistent when he uses numbers, and he chose to represent his son coming from heaven to earth by the number four. <coughs> Now, four is interesting. It's the first number that's divisible, not by itself. Four divided by two is two. But when it comes to Scripture, God rarely uses a number four uh, that way. It's almost always three and one. One represents divine unity. Three, divine fullness and perfection. And so God brings those uh, together in order to create the meaning of number four. And so in the gospel accounts, we have the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three. And then we have John, which is very unique presentation. Combined together, it uh, gives us four. So when you're going through scripture and the number four is being used in scripture, often it's three and one. Example of this would be in Revelation chapter six. The Lord Jesus opens the first of seven scrolls and we're introduced to four horsemen. There's four horsemen, but they're really a, a one and a three, right? The first one is the Antichrist. And then you have death and war and pestilence after. But the one and three, or the four horsemen in the book of Zechariah in his first vision, there's the one and the three. The one is the angel of the Lord, pre-incarnate Christ. And then you have the other three, which are angelic messengers. And so often in scripture, uh, God will combine three and one uh, to make four, and he's giving some kind of presentation of divine unity and fullness and completeness. All this to say that four, when it's used metaphorically in Scripture, almost always speaks of earthly order. Okay, God's order, God's rule on the earth. Um, God puts this uh, order in place which governs the affairs on earth. So let's just take a look and see how this um, is pertained. For example, um, we have four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. We have four regions of wind, north, south, east, and west. Four divisions of day, morning, noon, evening, night. Four regions where creatures dwell, upon the earth, below the earth, in the sea, and flying high above the earth. Uh, four classes of inhabitants. Revelation 5, 9 talks about this is the redeemed before the throne of God from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. In Matthew 13, when the um, <coughs> Lord gives those series of parables, the mysteries of the kingdom, in the first parable, there's four soils, which represent the four types of human hearts that the word of God is going to come in contact with. Right, You have that stony ground where the, the Word of God doesn't even penetrate the heart. And then you have the thin soil where the Word of God penetrates. Um, and there's visible evidence the Word of God did something, but it's not regeneration because there's no root in the soil. And there's also the, the thorny ground. And 
there's evidence that the word of God did something, but again, there's no fruitfulness. And the fourth ground is good ground. The word of God falls in, has a uh, supernatural effect. It results in regeneration and there's fruitfulness. Four types of human hearts that the word of God will confront. And then we have four phases of the moon, new, half, full, and half again. So looking at, uh, for example, in Revelation, when um, it says that the four angels went forth, you see something like the four corners of the earth that's metaphoric for worldwide influence. So when the four angels go forth and they stop the wind during this turbulent time on earth for the sealing of uh, God's covenant people at that time, these uh, Jewish evangelists during the tribulation period, when it says four winds or four corners of the earth, it's saying a worldwide effect. In other words, this is something that has influence over the entire world. So let's just follow this through from the Old Testament and show you how God is using this number four in a consistent way to convey um, that there is the Son of God was in heaven, and now he's coming down to the earth and putting himself under earthly order. He's enduring the contradiction of sinners. He's in living on a sin-cursed world. He left the heights of heaven, and now he's put himself under earthly order. So the first reference is back in Genesis 2. We're in Genesis 1 last night. Genesis 2, out of the river of Eden, that's God's presence in the garden, became four heads upon the whole land. So you had God's presence, number one, but then God coming out, his influence coming out to the whole world is represented in four rivers. And then we have the four branches. Matthew's Gospel presents Christ to a Jewish audience as the descendant of David, who is uh, the rightful heir to the throne of David. That's Matthew's unique perspective. Mark is writing to a, a Roman audience, and he's presenting the lowly servant of Jehovah. Luke is writing to a Greek audience, and he's presenting the Son of Man. He's presenting the Lord Jesus in his humanity. And then John is presenting Christ in his deity. He's writing to the whole world. You'll find the word world in uh, John's gospel around 80 times. And so when we get to the Old Testament, it's interesting. We have four branch statements. We have four behold statements. And so you'll read in the Old Testament, uh, behold your king, behold the man, um, behold my servant. And behold your God. Four behold statements. Again, upholding each of the gospel writers' presentation of the Lord Jesus. We have four branch statements. Jeremiah 23, 5. Unto David, the righteous branch, a king. That's Matthew's account. Zechariah 3, 8. My servant, the branch. That's Mark's account. He's the lowly servant of Jehovah. In Zechariah 6, 12, we read, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And then in Isaiah 4, verse 2, the branch of the Lord, beautiful and glorious. And that's John's account. This is not by accident. God is, is all the way from Genesis, um, the opening pages of the Bible, he's presenting uh, his son as coming from his presence into earthly order, represented by the number of four. And that's why there's four Gospels, four unique presentations of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the righteous branch, the king. He's my servant, the branch. He's the man whose name is the branch and the branch of the Lord being beautiful and glorious. We have the cherubim mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel, they're given by name in Ezekiel 10. In Ezekiel 1, he's describing these creatures that have four wings. Uh, with two of their wings, they cover their intrinsic glory in God's presence. With two wings, they outstretch and cover the uh, Shekinah glory of God. 
Uh, not that God needs protection, but anything that would be defiled or evil would be consumed by God's presence. Um, our brother last night, Mercer, was telling us about um, Satan still has access to the throne of God, which is mysterious, but it's we true. We see it in uh, the book of Job. We see it in Revelation 12, where he's accusing the brother day and night. But it's a, a veiled access. It's not... Satan does not get to see the Shekinah glory like he did in Ezekiel 28 when I believe he was on the inner circle as the chosen covering, the anointed covering cherub. He lost that position. So whether it's the cherub shielding um, that view of God or maybe God covers himself in darkness as the psalmist says, so Satan can't see his glory, we don't know, but he has a limited access Kind of like the um, the pillar that separated Pharaoh and the Israelites at the Red Sea. To the children of Israel, it was light. To Pharaoh's army, it was darkness. Same pillar. And so God could do that in heaven. Satan has limited access, but he still has access. He's accused of the brother day and night. So these cherubim, Ezekiel tells us in chapter 1 that they have four faces. And the faces are that of a lion, an ox, face of a man, and a face of an eagle. In Revelation chapter 4, when we're talking about, John's talking about the four living creatures around the throne of God, same four faces are mentioned. Now, the four living creatures might be seraphim. We read about them in several books of the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 6 is probably the most uh, popular portion of scripture that talks about them they have <clears throat> they have one face it's possible the four living creatures are seraphim they might be different creatures they have the same role they fly above god's holy throne calling out holy 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 is the lord of hosts six wings four they cover their intrinsic glory two they fly and their business is calling glory to god's name day and night we're going to get to see them and all the hosts of heaven declaring the glory of God. Now, what's interesting is the lion is the king of the beasts. The ox is the beast of burden. Man speaks of human, uh, humanity. And the eagle flies high above the earth. And so even in the faces of these heavenly beings, God is representing the glory of his son. In the face of the lion, he's, uh, that's Matthew's gospel presentation. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a legitimate heir to the throne of David. And in, in the ox, that's the beast of burden. That's Mark's uh, presentation of him as a servant. Uh, the man is easy to see. That's his humanity. And then, again, the eagle flies high above the earth, speaking of his deity. We also have these four colors. When you go through the tabernacle, if you don't see the gold <coughs> or the silver, if you're actually looking at colors of tapestry and linens, there are four. There was purple, there was red, there was white, and there was blue. And those are the four colors in the tabernacle. Why four? Again, it's God's presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the four Gospels. So let's just take a look um, as we're thinking about the tabernacle. I'm going to start over here and face east. So here we are in the holies of holies, um, this 10 by 10 cubic uh, little room, and we have the Ark of the Covenant, we have the mercy seat on top, we have two cherubim on either side with their four wings extended over, two they're, they're covering them in glory, but each cherubim has two wings, and so uh, one, 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 one Ark of the Covenant, one mercy seat, and the glory of God is above the mercy seat, that's number one, but immediately when you leave God's presence, the number four just explodes, you look up, you've got four layers over the tabernacle, right? You've got the badger skin, the ram skin, the goat skin. And then when you look up, you have these, this linen, which has got a cherubim and so forth, uh, all woven into it, embroidered into it with the four colors. Four layers, four colors. We're coming out from the cherubim with four wings. And immediately you come to the veil. The veil had... Again, the four colors with the cherubim embroidered into it, hanging on four pillars. 
Number four, we come out of the most holy place to the holy place. Again, we see the golden altar of incense, uh, four-sided uh, altar, four horns on each of the corners. As we keep walking through the uh, most holy place to the holy place, we come out into the courtyard, and there where we see the, the labor and then the bronze altar. Again, four sides, four horns, and as we walk clear to the, um, the gate of the courtyard, we see again four curtains hanging on four pillars. In other words, in God's presence in the most holy place, that's where Christ was, but he is the son of man. Uh, John says that it's the spirit of antichrist to deny that the son of God came to the earth as a man. And so as soon as he leaves God's presence, the number of four explodes in the tabernacle. Well, what's outside of the, the courtyard of the tabernacle? Humanity. And so we have this pathway from the presence of God and the Son of God coming into the world and being presented from these four unique vantage points. I, I find it just fascinating. Uh, Christ's flesh was a veil. It veiled, a veil conceals things and it also reveals things, right? And so, for example, the uh, the head covering conceals glories, but it also allows God's glory to be seen. And it's the same with the Lord's flesh. He was, he is God. He's being veiled by flesh, but that allowed God in person to be as close as possible to those he wanted to reach. And that's what the veil did. We read in Exodus that the, from God's perspective, the altar of incense really related to the, the Ark of Covenant. But it had to be on the other side of the veil so the high priest could come in twice a day and put his incense on that golden altar of incense. But the veil provided separation but it, uh, so that God, man could get as close to God to serve him as possible, but it also revealed the holiness of God because if they came inside there, they would die. And so the veil uh, reveals and conceals things and the Lord Jesus, his flesh was a, a veil which concealed the Shekinah glory of God and allowed the Lord Jesus Christ as a man to rub shoulders with those he came to reach day in and day night. And people could look at their, there's the essential glory of the Lord, he's divine, but there's the moral glory of the Lord Jesus. Every day, each page of the Gospels as you go through this permeates the moral excellence of God, the character of God, the graciousness, the mercy, and so forth, day after day. And then there was a the glory that the Lord received when he finished the work and he was highly exalted to the right hand of God. As we read in Hebrews 1, he's seated right now at the right hand of majesty. So, um, number four really explodes as uh, we come out from the presence of God. All right, so this is kind of, uh, this is an introductory session to where we're going with the study. Let's just think through some of the specifics. So in Matthew, he is a tax collector. He's an official. Who better than a, an official to represent the official glory of Christ? He as the king, the promised Messiah, the descendant of David who will sit on the throne forever. And he is speaking to a, a Jewish audience. When we look at key phrases and words in Matthew, you'll find the word kingdom, king, fulfill, uh, throne, altar, righteousness, king of heaven, uh, prophet, hell, dream, to, I say unto you, the son of David, and from that time. From that time actually splits the Matthew into three main sections. So you have the reference to kingdom over and over again in Matthew's gospel account. He is, uh, oh thanks, he is representing the uh, official glory of Christ as a descendant of uh, David who shall sit on the throne. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 1. Let's show you how this comes through. 
Did we lose this? All right, so Matthew chapter 1. When we look at Luke's gospel account, and this is representing the humanity of Christ, when God is giving communication like to Mary, he sends Gabriel. Gabriel meets with Mary in the privacy of her home, and they're talking face to face. Uh, very personal. That's Luke's presentation. That's Often that's how the Lord is conveying revelation. But in Matthew... Uh, Matthew is taking the Old Testament scripture and he's trying to convince his Jewish countrymen, listen, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, this is the promised one. And so the revelation in Matthew is either referring back to the Old Testament prophecies or it's in dreams, less personal. Uh, God's going to direct Joseph three different times by dreams. In Luke's account, Gabriel speaking face to face to Mary, very personal, pulling out the human aspects of it. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, we have in verse 29, God conveying to uh, Joseph in a dream information, saying that, yes, the this, this son in Mary's womb is, is the son of God. Uh, take her as, as your wife. And it says in verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, and is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him, took to him his wife. Okay, and then look at um, verse. 5 of chapter 2. So they said to him, um, the Magi were looking for the Lord. Where's, where's Messiah going to be born? And the Jews didn't even know. They weren't looking for Messiah. They had to go look it up. They came back and said, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It says in verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Notice it is written by the prophet. Verse 15, and there until he, this is when he's called out of um, Israel, he go to Egypt for a time to be saved from Herod's wrath. It says in verse 15, and it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I shall call my son. You read the word fulfilled 18 times in Matthew's gospel. And so Matthew is very careful. He's taking the Old Testament scripture and he says, this is the Christ. This is the Christ. Only Christ could fulfill these scriptures. And so he's trying to excite his Jewish countrymen about the fact that Messiah has actually come. So again, key words, king or kingdom, authority, righteousness. These are words that Matthew uh, continues, mountain, five times you'll find mountain in the Gospel of Matthew. Mountains represent kingdoms. We learned that last night from Daniel chapter 2, right? That beautiful picture of a, a stone <coughs> cut without human hands, speaking of the Lord coming down and smiting the, uh, the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of all Gentile empires. He smites the last empire, the whole thing comes crumbling down, the wind blows the shaft away. And then that stone that smote the final Gentile empire grows up to be a tall mountain. And that's the promised kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of Messiah. And so mountains are very big in Matthew's gospel, much more so than the other gospel writers. Then we get to uh, Mark. Mark is presenting Christ as his humble servant. Twelve of the sixteen chapters of Mark begin with a conjunction. And Jesus did this, and Jesus did that. And then we have um, two Greek adverbs, uthios, uth, uthios and uthus, which are translated uh, immediately or forthwith. And so what Mark is 
giving us is, and Jesus was doing this, and Jesus was doing that, and he was doing it very quickly and forthwith, and he's just this, he's this man who is pouring out his soul to serve others. He's going place to place. No wonder our Lord fell asleep in the stern of a boat during a raging storm. I think he was in utter exhaustion most of the time. People were coming and going. He was meeting early with his father in the morning for prayer. I think he was, the Lord never used his deity to satisfy his humanity. When he was hungry, he didn't whip up a Big Mac and fries, right? He never cheated. Otherwise, how could the writer of Hebrews say he, he understands all of our infirmities, it's been tested in every way we have, so we can come to the throne of grace to receive mercy in time of need. That wouldn't be a legitimate offer if he cheated. The Lord never cheated. He didn't use his deity to satisfy his humanity. And so I think he lived, Mark is showing this, uh, the Savior who is just pouring himself out from place to place, doing this and that, and doing it immediately. Uh, Uthus and Uthios, I think there are 45 times in the Gospel of Mark. The other three Gospels, there's only a third of that. So again, Mark's the shortest um, gospel to count with 16 chapters, presenting a Savior just exhausting himself uh, to do the will of the Father. And so we read a lot of uh, forthwith, immediately, shortly, straight away. <coughs> also a lot of touching and looking at Mark. Who's a good servant? Somebody who looks over and sees what's needed to done, and they jump into action. And that's the kind of Savior that Mark presents to us. A safe, it's someone who's looking to serve others and is then not afraid to exhaust themselves to meet the need. It's beautiful. And then in Luke, Luke is a Gentile, he's a physician. Who better than a physician to give us all the human aspects of the Lord's interaction with those he came to uh, call to himself? Uh, presents his pure humanity. And he's speaking from a Greek to a Greek. Uh, Mark is speaking to a Roman audience. At this time, when the Lord was on earth, the Roman Empire was about 120 million people. Half of them were slaves. So Mark's presentation is something that the Roman audience could really relate to. Uh, when we get into Mark, I'm going to show you that um, a lot of the, the political thinking at the time, the Roman Senate had actually deified some of the Caesars. And they were teaching that they were gods and that they had brought the good news. All right? So uh, Mark is correcting that and saying, no, the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. He is the good news. And so Mark's gospel is going to directly confront the main ideologies of the Roman Empire at that time. Something that the Romans could really much uh, relate to. So Luke, you're going to read about... A man, the son of man, that's a big phrase in the Gospel of Luke. It was a term that the Lord Jesus often used of himself. There's no one in Scripture that, that addresses the Lord as the son of man. When Stephen was being getting ready to be stoned, well, he was being stoned, he was getting ready to die, he looked up into heaven and said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, that infuriated the Pharisees. Why? Because that's how Lord Jesus identified himself at his trial. They knew who he was talking about. And what I was saying is, the Lord Jesus, who you crucified, is in heaven, exalted at God's right hand. They infuriated him, and they killed Stephen. But no person ever addressed the Lord as the Son of Man. He dressed himself as the Son of Man. It was speaking of the fact that he came from heaven and became a man to bring the message of salvation to humanity. He was the message and the messenger. And so in Luke's Gospel account, we read of uh, blessing and mercy and peace, uh, these human emotions that we can very much relate to, joy. Again, he's uh, presenting the human element. And then we get to John. He was a fisherman, the beloved disciple, the disciple who never refers to himself by name in his gospel account. He's writing to the whole world, world uh, some, around 80 times in the gospel of John. And so he's presenting the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so we have the phrase, the only begotten of the Son, the Son of God. The Lord Jesus speaks specifically, my Father. The Jews understood what he was saying. You make yourself equal with God. They picked up stones and wanted to stone them. The Lord Jesus was clearly, in John's Gospel, saying he is God. I am. Seven times we have him declaring, I am. The, what we get from in Exodus chapter 3, the self-existent one. I am who I am. God is completely self-existent in himself. And that's what the Lord Jesus was saying. I am. Um, I use John 8.24 with some of my Jehovah Witness friends when they come to the door. They usually share a verse with me. And I say, I have a verse for you. The Lord Jesus said, unless you believe I am, you shall perish in your sins. But he's not in the text. You have to be, I don't think you can be saved if you have a demented view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John is upholding um, the Lord and his deity. And this is so key. I mentioned that you won't find the word repent um, or forgive in John's gospel. And it seems like, well, how can you get saved without repentance and forgiveness? John's not saying that's not necessary. That's just not his perspective. John's giving us the high view, the heavenly view of God's Son. And when God looks down on the earth, everyone is spiritually dead. We died in Adam. We're corrupt. We're enemies of God. You read in Romans chapter 5. And so what John is saying is he's given us a heavy view, the heavenly view. When God looks down, man is dead and trespasses and sins. The, whole, the Lord, when he was walking on earth, it was like he was walking through a cemetery. He's the only one spiritually alive. And so God is giving the heavenly perspective in John's gospel Dead in sin, life in Christ. So life and love are key words in the Gospel of John, and life. Camp Iloli, that's where they get their, the name of their camp, is from the Gospel of John, those three key words of life, love, and, and life. And so John is giving us a heavenly perspective. Everyone on earth needs to be born again. You're dead. You need to be made alive. That's his perspective. You go to Matthew and Luke, a lot of repent and a lot of forgiveness. That's another quality of the gospel. They're both true. But John is just saying from God's perspective, uh, you're dead in trespasses. You need to be born again, John 3.3. 3. You need to be made alive. So he really uh, focuses on rebirth and the need for a new life. Uh, not just a, a life that in John 10, when he's talking about the, the shepherd laid down his life, he gives us an uh, abundant life. It's, the, it's a life worth living, and that's what the Lord gives us. So as you look at these uh, four perspectives, um, it's going to be exciting in the next few sessions just to see some of these uh, deliberate omissions, deliberate inclusions that the Holy Spirit puts in, and what God is trying to do is get us excited about a son, that we can uh, read Matthew and say, wow, this is great. God is showing us this presentation of a son. Then go to another gospel and say, oh, this is another aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Father wants us to appreciate. So this is a way of introduction. Um, we'll pick up with uh, the gospel of Matthew this evening. So let me just pause there. We'll, we'll take our questions now and then we'll, then we'll pray. If you don't have any questions, we'll just pray. <clears throat> 